Welcome in. This is the Tuesday Not So Deep Dive episode. We have Brad Freeman on the show today, and we're going to be talking a, I guess, fast growing brand, one of the fastest growing apparel and shoe brands in the world. It's called All Birds. Brad, this was your choice, and I think you are a owner of some sneakers, uh, as along with Ryan. So, first off, what's your opinion on the All Birds brand um, before we get started here? Yeah. Uh... I'm not as I'm not an extremely fashion forward person. I, I wear most of the same hoodies that I wore in high school, but these are the most comfortable shoes I've I've ever worn in my entire life. And and we were talking about how they're very versatile. They go with a lot of uh, they go. With, I I think I'm not very fashion forward, but I think they go with a lot of different things. Um, so so I'm a I'm a big fan uh, of, of the shoes, and the company did not even pay me to advertise or promote or anything like that. This is all this is all organic. <laughs> Right. Yeah. We'll get some free marketing out there. I think Ryan holds the same views, but we'll get to that in the anecdotal evidence later. And I'm going to let Ryan introduce the company and it's very interesting history. I see some nice notes he has there, but first we have to talk about our sponsor, Potential Multibaggers. The aim of the Potential Multibagger service is to find stocks that can go up 10 X over the next 10 years or compound at 26% per year. So Chris, who is running it, who we've had on the show before and will be on the show in the future actually talking about upstart, which little spoiler there, we're going to have that coming out soon. And that's one of his picks from back in the day, uh, or at least a year ago or something around there. He picked it at $128 a share. He picked square at $75 a share. Shopify, his first pick ever back in the day was $77 a share. So the track record has been phenomenal. Yeah, there are winners and losers in the portfolio, but overall the portfolio has done phenomenally well and he does great analysis and write-ups along with it. So if you are into these type of investments, uh, these type of growth stocks, uh, higher risk, high reward, something you want to hold on for the long term, you want to sign up for potential multi baggers, go to Seeking Alpha and look for From Growth to Value. Google it or go to at From Value on Twitter. Make sure to check it out. Also, we should highlight we're running the year end promotion for seven investing. That's $50 right. off your annual subscription with code chit chat. That'll end with the new year. So get it while you can. If you're thinking of signing up for seven investing, do it now while we have this extended discount. All right, Ryan, why don't you introduce Allbirds? Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll take the first line of their S1 and they say, we make better things in a better way through nature. Um, and I think that might be the vaguest mission statement I've ever seen. I don't know about you guys that I, I took nothing away from that statement. Um, but basically they're just a footwear and apparel company. Um, and it was, uh, the S one's a little strange reading it because there's like a lot of focus on the environmental side, um, and less on the sales side of the business. So, um, that's uh, the core business is that they use sustainable materials to build shoes. Um, and that that's really how they got started. And now they're also moving into apparel and the original shoes were made with Merino wool. I think I'm saying Merino, right? It's either Merino or Merino. Um, and that's just like a certain, certain type of sheep in New Zealand. And it's kind of a finer wool. It's a little bit thinner. It, most people think of wool as like frizzy jackets. It's not really like that. It's, it's, uh, the, the shoes are well kept, I guess. Um, and then the shoes are very basic. There's no logo on them. It's usually just one or two colors. It was designed to be sort of minimalist. And they, they even say, they call their design strategy, the right amount of nothing. Um, and the shoes are also really comfortable, especially the wool ones. I think they were labeled the most comfortable shoe in the world on um, that, or that's, uh, that was a headline on New York times time and, magazine or time magazine. Yeah. And then, uh, also Oprah and Obama used to wear them. So they were like big, uh, huge, huge. <laughs> big it's advocates for the product. It's gotta be a good investment now. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, that's most of their uh, that that's primarily their footwear. And then they, they have 14 different shoe styles. I believe it's 14. It could be more than that. There's like derivatives off basically the exact same shoe type that they might classify in there, but, uh, there's over 50 different products across footwear and apparel. And so the other apparel offerings, you can basically group them into two different groups. So lifestyle and performance. So some are meant for more casual wear, think like, uh, button up short sleeve t-shirts, kind of like camp t-shirts, the kind of thing. And then there's like athletic shorts, there's socks. Uh, they, they have plenty of different stuff. Um, and then, then they're also a B Corp, which Brad, I guess you have experience investing in a B Corp. Do you know the differences between that and the general corporate structure? So 
really so they the, the, the taxation is a little bit less efficient as a b corp versus an s corp so so that's that's a drawback it's really it's really a promotional tactic for these companies there's a really strict vetting process that uh, i don't even know what the b corp board is called but that they put companies through to ensure that they're making an appropriately positive contribution to the world beyond just fattening their pockets with more profits so lemonade's a b corp um that really wasn't any piece of me liking the company uh, but but definitely something to keep in mind. And and yeah, uh, taxation a, a little less appealing with B Corp versus S Corp. Okay. Yeah, and they uh, they didn't do an initial public offering. They did a sustainable public the offering. The first Huge. sustainable public the offering first ever. first one, these are sustainable dollars, not like those initial dollars, whatever in an IPO. No, it's not the like, same Not thing. like your dirty money. Yeah, uh, I thought that was funny. Um, but sorry, Ryan, continue. That is, they, yeah, that's a big part of sort of their company ethos and mission is the whole environmental part. So, um, you know, and part of me felt like that was, uh, well, I've, I've listened to the founders speak yeah. and they, they are serious about that, but it also sounded like they were just going for ESG funds. Yeah. And, and that's the brand they're trying to sell to consumers. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Um, but the history is actually really fascinating. So, uh, Timothy Brown, who Brad will talk about, uh, in a little bit here, um, was a soccer player from New Zealand. He went to school at University of Cincinnati. So he came to America for college and he was, he played soccer there as well. But afterwards he was able to join a pro team in New Zealand. Um, and he was actually good enough to be on the national team and played in the 2010 world cup. Um, they tied Spain for any soccer fanatics out there and Spain won that world cup. They, they were actually undefeated. Um, and didn't make it out of group play. They tied all three games. So they were the only undefeated team in that world cup. Um, but anyway, so pro soccer players always get like a month or so off each year. And after the world cup, Tim, Tim Brown used that month to test his design skills that he got while he was studying at Cincinnati. So that was kind of what he majored in. It's always been sort of a passion of his. Um, and he was also never a big logo guy. So he got a sponsorship when he was an athlete and he, he didn't really like the idea of wearing logos. He was always considered himself sort of a minimalist. So he went to a factory in Indonesia during this month off and he asked them to make a thousand pairs of this basic shoe style, um, which they still have today. Um, and they, they did it. And he took those shoes back to his team and he sold them to all of his teammates at full price. I think it was 120 bucks per shoe uh, or per, per pair of shoes. Um, and they all liked them. So by that point uh, he kind of wanted to do this full time. He was also considering retiring uh, from the team. And so he did, he stepped away and he started to try to pursue this. Obviously running a retail business on your own, that size is really, really tough. And so he ended up getting connected with his co-founder, Joseph Zwillinger. I think I'm saying the name right, um, through his through their girlfriends. And Zwillinger had sort of background in consulting. And so he was more business savvy. And at one point, Tim was offered a basically funding round from a VC that was, it had a lot of terms and stuff that uh tim wasn't super familiar with so he kind of consulted joe about this like do you think this is a good idea and joe said no here why don't you let me help you and they kind of got into this together and the two of them uh grew from there they ran their business on shopify um and that was all around 2015 so they've gone from that to we'll talk about this more than 200 million dollars in sales in the in less than five years so i think that's really sort of a testament to how fast companies are able to grow now, thanks to the creator tools. Like think about it, they were able to set up all that and grow that quickly within five years, all thanks to primarily Shopify, which- I guess, yeah, good time. We just did the show on them. So if yeah. you haven't listened to that one, go back and listen to uh, why Shopify has been able to just grow like crazy over the last uh, five years. Yeah, and then they've had plenty of funding rounds since, and they finally IPO just, it's been less than a month since they've been, since they've been public. I don't think they've had a public quarter um, nope, it's uh, November 30th. So when you're listening to this, it might be right around that time. But yeah, November 30th, if I remember correctly. So should be soon. Um, I'll hit industry competition. Allbirds, this one is going to be simple. It's in the shoe and apparel industry. And it's very easy. Sorry. I should that? add, there is a, uh, I got a lot of the information from the founder's interview with, uh, what's his name on how I built this with Guy Raz. Um, so if you want to hear more of the story, go there. All right. Well, I'll hit industry and competition. Like I said, shoot and perils, easy to quantify worldwide estimated to be $1.9 trillion in sales in 2020. All birds ambition is to sell into that as much as it possibly can. Um, competitors include Nike, Adidas. I know some people call it Adidas. Um, I, I, as 
you might be laughing while I called Adidas, but that's what I've called it my whole life. So I'm going to call it that. Uh, there's also Lululemon and then dozens of other companies. I mean, possibly, probably hundreds of other companies, maybe even a thousand. There's so many apparel companies and shoe companies out there. Uh, for reference, their largest competitor, Nike, had last 12 month revenue of $46 billion. So when you scale this thing up, if you go worldwide, you can have a lot, a lot of sales. And I'll keep that one simple. So Brad, you want to hit management and ownership. Sure thing. So Joseph is Willinger. Uh, he's, he's 40 years old. He was the co-founder that, that Tim brought in to kind of um, maneuver their way through these VC deals that Ryan was talking about. But he was a or he is a former vice president at the industrial products company called Terravia. I don't really know a lot about that company, but it was on his LinkedIn resume, so I, I added it. He's also the board of on a he's also a member of the board of directors at a SPAC called Big Sky Growth Partners. So I guess depending on on who you are, you'll you'll view that in a more or less positive light. He has consulted at Deloitte, and he was an analyst at Goldman. So that really is where he gets his his business acumen from. Um, he's he, he's the he's really the the business development and and and, and I think he's he's got a um, he plays a vital role in, in the engineering and sustainable architecture for the product as well. Yeah, Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, so he's um, he's worked at sustainable companies in the past prior to joining Allbirds. They they were already using the wool for the shoes, but now they use a bunch of different materials, and so he has yeah, a long he's history. Biotech, right? Something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, business side, I guess, of biotechs. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, go, yeah um, continue. no good addition. And and 70 reviews on Glassdoor, 100% rating, but only 70 reviews on Glassdoor. So take with, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, Timothy Brown, he I mean, he's the brainchild for this idea. Uh, Ryan talked a lot about his successful soccer career, which I found pretty cool. Um, he's from New Zealand. He's passionate about wool. He's passionate about wool, I guess. Uh, not not a lot to say about him other than his soccer career and and his his um, Allbirds project. But he was the former manager in innovation strategy and business development at Red Scout, which I've also never heard of, which is a brand consulting company. Um, former and former, not only was he on the New Zealand World Cup team, but he was a vice captain of the New Zealand World Cup team. So um, if, if you need a bull case, I'm not sure if you need anything else beyond that, but completely kidding. Uh, Michael Bufano is the CEO, or I'm sorry, the CFO. He's been there since April 2021 former CFO of Panera. So he really has a lot of great experience. He climbed the ladder for a long time there. Um, and, and for about a year before he joined Allbirds, he was um, advising early stage companies, uh, Joe Vernaccio, uh, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. He's the COO, uh, former VP of global product at North Face. So perfect experience there, R really nice overlap. And former president of Mountain Hardware, which again, great experience, a lot of overlap. So ownership, uh, dual class share structure. Thank you, Allbirds, for only having two classes of shares. Um, this, this ownership that I'm about to give assumes full exercise of op options, and it's still before the offering data, so it could have changed a little bit after their IPO. We haven't gotten an annual filing or, or prospectus, so um, it could have changed a little bit. But Maveron and, and Dan Leviton, so I'm sorry if I pronounced those incorrectly, um, Tiger Global, T. Rowe Price, and Fidelity own about 38.3% of the total vote, voting power. That's almost entirely in Class B stock. Uh, Joseph owns about 10.3% of the voting power. Again, almost entirely in Class B. Same thing with Timothy, 12.3%, uh, almost exclusively in Class B. Um, executives together own around 37.4% of the combined voting power. So there's really good, a, a lot of representation uh, between pre-IPO institutions and, and executives and insiders. So always like to see that. Yeah, pretty standard ownership structure there. It's not like Dutch Bros when we were covering the past where it was so confusing. This uh, Even if it's dual class, this one is very easy to understand. I'll hit valuation quick. It's a simple one. Market cap, $3.5 billion. Ticker is BIRD, B-I-R-D. They stole that from the scooter company. So I guess congratulations to them. Price to sales of 14.5. Price to gross profit of 27.5. So you might be a bit disappointed in seeing that. Um, I know we all were, uh, but that's kind of how you know it goes with the IPO. So you got to know that this valuation is going to be um, as premium as it gets. And then look, they don't really have any earnings right now. Um, I, Ryan will get into what kind of margins they're at and what kind of burn they're at. But given the need for these type of businesses to continually advertise, it's probably important for investors to watch where the operating margin expansion is coming from as Albert tries to grow its customer base because they're going to have to spend you know, they'll probably have a flat GNA spend, or maybe it'll grow a small amount. They're hopefully going to have a bit of a margin expansion from, you know, R&D as a percentage of revenue, 
which they're actually spending a lot on because they try to do all the tech for sustainability stuff. And then uh, advertising as a percentage of revenue, you're going to want to see that continually go down um, as showing that you know they're making progress here. And then one note, they have 17.9 million outstanding stock options before the IPO. You'll need to watch that as well as their granting pace looks like it definitely present a headwind for shareholders. No surprise there. Company came out of San Francisco. Um, they kind of have you know, those type of companies have more of the culture of granting the stock options, um, at least anecdotally. I don't have any data around that, but it's not a bad or a good thing. It's just a way they're financing that business. Uh, and what? A, let me let me check how many options are. You don't, you don't have any outstanding, uh, like 140 million. So it's not like they're going to double their share count, but that's how many there were before the IPO. You also may want to check when the new filing comes out, how many of those converted before the IPO. There's all this confusion without the, you know, the 10Q or the 10K coming out, like Brad said, but Ryan, do you want to hit earnings? Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk the S1 numbers and then remember that I think new earnings will be coming out right as you're probably listening to this. So you will have a public quarter to look at. Um, but in 2020, they had $219 million in revenue. That was up 13% from 2019, but 74% from 2018. Um, and part of that was impacted. And we'll talk about that um, or I may, I'll just mention it now. So they opened some retail stores. They're trying to do this omni-channel strategy. Most of it still comes from digital, but they opened a lot of those during 2020. And obviously there wasn't as much physical retail done in 2020. So, uh, physical in-store sales may have been a little depressed. How much of that converted to digital sales instead? It's kind of hard to tell, but uh, in aggregate, it was up, there was a 13% growth from 2019 to 2020. So that's, I guess what you want to look at. And then they have 51.4% gross margins. Uh, that was at about 46.9% in 2018. So slight improvement there. And then 89% of their sales come from their digital channels, or at least in 2020, they did while 11% came from those retail stores. Um, and they've grown their store footprint from three stores in 2018 to 22 by the end of 2020. And I think they're at like 27 now. They have 27 right now. Yeah. So they are making that a big part of their strategy is to, you know, become this omni-channel company and not just be solely digital. And then they've got uh, they aren't profitable. So they've got an operating margin of negative 13% and they spend about 25% of their revenue on marketing. Uh, and their adjusted EBITDA margin is slightly better at around negative 7%. Uh, that doesn't convert that well to cash flow though. So I, I wouldn't take too much, uh, I want to put too much emphasis on that number. Um, and then one one really interesting point that I saw in their S1, in 2020, 53% of their net sales came from repeat customers. That looks really promising and it's a well do figure. you think that's a good or a bad thing well it means you, have, you can spend less on marketing for the exit yeah i yeah glass have full that but also glass have empty are they get how many new customers are they getting that's kind of the that's kind of the the thing you got to balance there i don't know what do you guys think on that right. i mean i like repeat activity i think it's a an overall positive yeah probably yeah i think i mean if it's a repeat i mean i'm a repeat customer and I guess this is just anecdotal, but I, I I go directly there. I don't need, if I'm looking for shoes, I don't need marketing anymore. Um, and so it's kind of stuck in my mind that way. Do you think if that number continues to grow, is that a good thing though? If it, it as long, I guess as if long as- If overall sales have, are growing. Yeah, if overall sales are growing at a good rate, I guess it's fine. Um, all right, balance sheet and liquidity. Brad, what do you got for us? It'd almost be interesting to see like a net revenue retention rate, which wouldn't make any sense because there's no recurring revenue here. But- I mean, that would, that would be so funny if they had something like that to, to break it out. But cohort but yeah. analysis could be interesting. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that that would be that would work. Um, yeah, that that would work well. But balance sheet and liquidity. So they raised about three hundred million dollars in their IPO. That added to about ninety-five million in cash and equivalents on the balance sheet. They have a forty million dollar credit revolver. Uh, they drew down about fourteen million of that last year, which carries an interest rate of about LIBOR plus two and a half percent. So really, really not bad at all. Um, not pristine balance. I mean, not a perfect balance sheet, but it's it's healthy and and really no no red flags there at all. Yeah, there's no hidden things to watch out. It's all pretty standard. Um, I mean, other than those the the stock options that that you were talking about, that's that's really the 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 stock. Yeah, the seventeen point nine million outstanding stock options is really the thing to keep an eye on for balance sheet. Um, it's more so equity dilution than than really high leverage. Yeah, I guess one of the great things about companies that receive a ton of funding rounds. As private companies, you don't usually have a lot of outstanding debt 
by yep. the time you get to the public markets. Yep. And one thing for a company like this, inventory is definitely important uh, for cash flow conversion. So, I mean, I don't think we have to tell many people to, about this, but definitely watch the inventory levels quarter to quarter. That can really change things. All right, let's hit the ad break. Okay, welcome back. Next up, we have anecdotal evidence. Both of you guys are owners or customers of Allbirds. So, Brad, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, their shoes rock. I'll, I'll leave it there. All right, positive. Yeah, positive for Brad. Ryan, I, you're very similar, but what do you, what do you got? I think their shoes rock too. Um, <laughs> I'm, I am a repeat customer. My brother is as well. Uh, if you're wondering, like if you're not uh, a customer and you're wondering what sort of the application is here, or like what the most common use case is, it's really, it's like nice casual. Um, but as Brad mentioned earlier, it's pretty versatile. So you could wear them to work. Um, at most, most places, yeah, I imagine most, yeah. you can wear them to work. Um, you can also wear them out going to lunch. You can wear them with shorts. You can wear them with pants. It, it, you know, it, it really works with a lot of different <laughs> this outfits. Is a, this is almost turning into a Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I don't know. Like, I don't even shop around anymore. Like I know that, uh, once I've kind of worn them out or gotten them dirty, like I'll just go back to Allbirds and buy that same pair of shoes. So you're like, uh, I go directly to their website too. I'm not going through any. I don't think they have any wholesalers, well, they can't, but they, yeah, you can't do anywhere else. The, uh, do you think, do you guys, this is hard to say it's all anecdotal, but do you think there's a potential for guys to like this as much as the Lululemon diehards that seem to be insane? Not well, maybe not, insane might be the wrong word, but love to spend a lot at Lululemon woman, uh, typically where their closets are filled with thousands and thousands of dollars worth. Is there that same potential for the diehards with all birds? Um, oh, yeah. do you think, Makes a fantastic pair, actually. Yeah, you were, Brett, you were talking about before the show, which I agreed with, like, okay, you say you're way more sustainable, so shouldn't that mean I'm buying way less things from you and, and way less frequently? So that that's the that's the main headwind that I see on the way up to getting there is that they're, like, like uh, we were, what were we talking about? The the jeans brand, Levi's, that 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 kind of talks or, or kind of pumps up how sustainable their jeans are, and so you don't need to buy as many of them. And so that's great for the value proposition for getting that sale. But when are you going to get that second sale? Um, that that's really the the question I have for them on, on filling out filling out the closet because the products are awesome. Um, and yeah, a lot of success so far. Right. That comes back to that repeat customers too. If you're really trying to be sustainable, um, I would think you'd want that number to go down because you really just want people to buy one one of your products. Or you could um, just encourage them to buy the products at the same time. That reduces some of the emissions. Well, it's true, I guess, but I mean, yeah. it's not common to do that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess my anecdotal, I don't, I, I've never bought anything from them, but it seems like unlike a lot of other of the D to C startups that have been out there, it seems like it has the potential to reach the top notch brand status, like a Nike, Adidas or Lululemon. Um, most of them, when people have that aspiration, you kind of look at them, you're like, eh, probably not, but all birds definitely could. Um, and those have been, well, I don't know about Adidas, but those have been strong, strong performers over the long term. I'll go a little further on the anecdotal evidence too. It, it, uh, with the no logo, it, it feels like it applies to a lot of people and they say that they get a lot of word of mouth marketing. I, I know a lot of brands probably do, but you almost feel like as a customer, you have to, because they're like, Oh, what shoes are those? Cause no one knows because there's no logo. Well, they got VCs talking at parties. So, you know. That's, and yeah, that's, that's, that's another way. <laughs> that's, that's a big opportunity. However, that may not, that clashes a bit with the data point they gave out that only 10% of people are aware of their product. Um, that's a big, something I may talk about in my lowlights as well, but we'll save all that rest of that discussion for the end. Um, future growth opportunities. Brad, what, what do you think? Sure. I, I think that that uh, statistic that we highlighted of their shoes have a 30% lower carbon footprint. I mean, our, our generation, younger generations, uh, go gaga over this ESG uh, sustainability theme and and whatever you think of it, our generations or younger people are very interested in in lowering um, their footprints, their environmental footprints, wherever they can in a really convenient way. We're not actually that dedicated to, to changing our lives to yeah. be. We're going to buy yeah ten of these and that'll, that'll save right. The more you buy yeah. these, right now. This is just a really, a really easy way to say I'm, I'm a sustainable human being and, and, and still be able to buy shoes. So I saw this partnership they, they had with the lowest carbon footprint per shoe in association, in association with Adidas. 
Um, so that was, I, I mean, if you can kind of glom onto them and, and, and hitch a ride on, on the Adidas bandwagon um, with these partnerships, uh, I think that could take care of a lot of the brand awareness issues and the marketing issues that they're having. Um, if they can just lean on Big Brother to do it for them. Um, but yeah, I think they their niche is, is really well placed for what our younger consumers are looking for. Yeah, definitely the the brand awareness stuff that the um, so they have that kind of nutrition label for the carbon footprint thing that they try to promote, and that type of stuff can really help people signal like what they want other people to think of them. We were talking about this too before the show, and that's probably an important part because the top apparel and shoe brands of all like of ever nike's the best one they're not really selling like anything special they kind of just advertise that if you wear your shoes you're you're like a great athlete even for anyone uh so when you wear them you have that feeling and it it seems like Allbirds needs to capture that same thing but from a sustainability standpoint and it sounds like so far they're really you know they're the best at it by far all right ryan what's your future growth opportunity uh so you you took the one that I kind of like, I guess, um, doing whatever they can. I don't think they have a whole lot of product expansion um, capabilities. And so some people might hate that I said that, but I think the apparel initiatives aren't going to go that far for them. I think they really are. They well, excel. T- t-shirts are way less profitable than shoes. Yeah. That's what, yeah. Yeah. And it's just not that. Like there isn't that much originality when, when they introduced like the no logo sleek shoe design, the right amount of nothing, it was kind of, it felt like one of the first with shirts. There's plenty of like just basic t-shirts. And so like, it's kind of hard to differentiate. I don't know. I don't, I haven't bought any shirts. I'm not huge into their apparel. And so I just don't know if that's going to move the needle for them. So I think really what they have to be doing is just finding finding as many ways that they can to get their shoes in front of all the customers that they can. And so they, you know, they're spending $50 million in marketing expenses. That's one way to do it. Um, especially if you turn a lot of those customers into repeat customers. Um, and then uh, store expansions is the other one, which Brett talked about. I, I really do like the omni-channel uh, strategy. And then I guess they might have some pricing power as well. This is sort of a, a dynamic that Lululemon has thrived on, which is it's almost like a social status thing to wear Lululemon because well, Nike's the Nike is the original. Yeah. I get, yeah. It, are, are Nike's that expensive? I don't wear a lot of Nike anymore. Well, I mean, they have all, they always sell their sneakers for a hundred or whatever. And then Jordan's, which is huge. The high, more expensive they are, more people want them. It's like Ferraris kind of. Yeah. Just th- that sort of uh, a dynamic I think could work for them. And right now their shoes are only about, I think it was like 98 bucks. I think, once again, it's anecdotal, but I'd be willing to pay more for them, uh, especially as a repeat customer. I, I don't mind. Now that again, that makes sense from an investor's perspective. I'm like, wow, that's nice. But from a sustainability perspective, don't you want to be, they talk about being the low cost producer. They talk about how carbon Explain the factories. Yeah. Like uh, if you really are on the sustainability bench, and this is great as a consumer or as just a citizen of the world, you, you want these things to be sold for as cheap as possible. I don't so think they can invest, make, like, yeah. I don't think I mean? they can it make clashes. the shoes. I just don't think they have the ability to make the shoes at a carbon net carbon negative. Um, well, that's, I mean, or net carbon neutral, but I guess if they just, well, no, reinvest the, is, the proceeds. I know, the, but if you want, if these are better for the environment, wouldn't you want, wouldn't their if their whole goal isn't to make money but to also save the environment wouldn't you want to sell as many sneakers as you can instead of nikes so raising prices is counterintuitive to that maybe but as an investor that's like what happened to peloton when they raised prices i well no i'm just saying as an investor that concerns me when i see that you know like if your goal is for sustainability how much are I don't know, but maybe they're just doing it for the ESG stuff. Who knows? Right, I don't know. Is that confusing? Have? Where like raising prices is well, yeah, obviously, obviously, it's, if you're in the B Corp, yeah. yeah, but that's if that's if if volume shrinks on a price increase. If volume doesn't shrink on a price increase, who cares? Yeah, but all else equal, volume will increase if prices go down. Yeah, well, you got to you got to manage being a public company. I know, but that's I mean, 
That's my concern from an investment perspective. All right. And you don't know that. Think about think about Peloton. I, well, I would say standard demand curves. Yeah. I, yeah. But they follow that logic 100 percent. But yeah, but that most people can't afford that. Most people can't afford a hundred and fifty dollar shoe. They they don't. Yeah, I mean they target an affluent customer base. So if you want to be fully sustainable, prices are going to have to go down. Not if you want to have a sustainable but, business. But as an investor, prices go up. I, I mean, I'd be happy. All right, we uh, All right, it's a on tangent. Mine. Move on. Uh, I think it's a simple one. Expanding store count so easy. I probably stole the easiest one. That's really. I don't know. That's probably the biggest thing to look out for. They have 27 right now, but they're, they're, they said they want to get to hundreds and they're getting to the size where it can really be beneficial for driving sales and brand awareness. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned this already, but only 10% of the population knows of Allbirds. So getting these stores out there could be a great way to get that out there as free advertising and also a way to sell. Similar to the Nike store, everyone knows how good those have done over the long, like, I mean, those things are always crowded. And they're huge and it's kind of a big store highlighting all their research and stuff like that and all, all, all the different athletes they have. But with Allbirds, you can do that highlighting their research and sustainability um, and get more people interested in the brand and kind of being a, a fan or a loyal fan, so, so to speak. Uh, I guess watching that would be a big one. But let's move on to highlights and lowlights. Brad, what's your uh, what do you like and dislike about Allbirds? Yeah. So a, a couple of years ago, Allbirds and Amazon kind of got into a, a fight because Allbird, or Amazon was allowing a ton of knockoffs of Allbirds to be sold on their marketplace. And Allbirds kind of said, for you guys, we're not going to sell our products through your platform anymore. So I thought that was a highlight that a company that was three years old at this time ha- thought that they had the, the clout, the brand power, the awareness not to use Amazon's marketplace. And I, I mean, Growth did slow down a lot, a lot this year, but they've compounded pretty successfully since 2016 and they've done it without Amazon. So I, I think um, in terms of ceiling for margins, that that's a that's a, a really positive thing for them, that they're not um, relying on these really low margin Amazon marketplace sales uh, to grow. Uh, but but yeah, um, in terms of low lights, everyone can can access wool in New Zealand. Uh, there's not a lot here that that's super unique so this is this really is about running as as fast as you can to capture the ubiquity to capture the brand power and to capture that status symbol that ryan was talking about as i'm wearing this shoe so i have a little money in my pocket and i care about the planet um that that will take a lot of spending uh, on sales and marketing and, and and i don't expect that to slow down at all so i think profitability is probably a long way off and i mean just juxtaposing that with 13% 13% revenue growth uh, and, a, and a 15 or whatever it was times sales multiple. Um, yeah, I, I'll try not to go into valuation here, but but that's that's where I see the low light. Yeah, I think everyone can, uh, yeah, we, we can connect, we can all connect the dots there, but that Amazon br- breakup is definitely a huge highlight for me too. I mean, that shows that not many companies probably could have done that. Um, all right, Ryan, what do you got? What do you like and dislike? Well, I- uh, the cohort analysis, they, they gave some sort of analysis on the cohorts and their existing customers. And that was pretty, uh, it was pretty promising. The 53% of sales coming from repeat customers. I think that once people start to try these shoes on, uh, they tend to like them, they tend to stick with them. Um, and if that trend persists, the high marketing spend now is worth it because hopefully you don't have to spend as much on those customers moving forward. And it, it's all right if your customers are repeat customers, as long as sales are continuing to increase. Um, and then I like the omni-channel strategy. Uh, also, I guess the, the biggest highlight is that it's, uh, I really like the product and it's hard to put something, it's hard to put context in that. And it's part, hard to frame an investment thesis around that. But sometimes you look at a, you look at a company say like, do people love the product? And those tend to end up making really good investments. It feels like one of those granted, there's a lot of low lights as well. So for me, I'm not really convinced, um, they're able to succeed in apparel and I haven't really seen a whole lot to convince me otherwise. So you're saying succeeding in non shoes. Yeah. Okay. Which they are making endeavors into that. So, um, you know, that's CapEx wasted, I guess, if it doesn't work out. And then also I'm not sure how there's sort of this double edged sword of not having a logo. People like the simplicity, but at the same time, it's easier to replicate. It's so easy. That's my big holdup. The only thing is like, can people tell the difference? It hasn't the happened whole. yet. 
maybe it has, but I haven't noticed any companies succeed well, copying all birds. Remember $1.9 trillion industry, a lot of white space for these sustainable type things. Are they stealing like, okay, could those Amazon knockoffs steal from Nike? Yeah. Is it more of a threat to Nike or something like that? But I wonder how much of it, how much of those Amazon knockoffs have taken from potential Allbirds customers. I, I guess we don't know for sure. Um, but the, the other low light for me is that trends in fashion and apparel tend to ebb and flow. And if it's just one shoe that's really thriving or like maybe two shoes that are really thriving, what, what's the durability of the business kind of comes into question. Yeah. And that the durability, I think, and I'm no brand expert, anyone that knows me knows I'm the opposite of a brand expert, but the thing that seems to let companies with these sort of maybe just commodity products that are all driven on a brand is that they really sell some sort of like signaling thing where Nike, like I said before, they're selling, you know, athletic greatness basically. And Alberts could do that maybe with the sustainability thing, but the contrast with the logo, I guess, like, I, I just think like when I'm walking in somewhere, how do I know someone's wearing Alberts? Someone could just copy it. Right. Is that, that's my, is that wrong or is that, is that right? I would say that that sounds right in theory, but I, I can notice when people are wearing Alberts. I know, but couldn't, could they copy the, make it basically the exact same looking shoe? I don't know. For me, for me personally, it's about like how comfortable and easy to put on they are. So you'd have to replicate that and, and, and the style. I mean, I like the style, but I really like how comfortable it is. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not sure if, if, cutting input costs um, would sacrifice that. I, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on New Zealand wool, uh, but but yeah, that's a good thing to bring up, I think. Yeah, and I wonder if someone can copy the comfortability. Maybe it's harder than than I'm assuming, but that, that's my big low light. Let's see, um, highlights, low co- loyal customers, as you guys are two examples of. Decent unit economics, I think. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're burning money right now, but it looks pretty good, especially that margin expansion. And there's a pen- potentially a long runway for, reinvestment if these type of products become wanted by everyone the you know the, the glass half full of only 10 percent of u.s consumers knowing that all birds exist is that there's 90 percent that could be potential customers and that's a great thing and i also like management you guys didn't mention this but i think you guys probably agree they seem competent they don't seem like a crazy silicon valley startup people and it seems like they're focused on the right things um we'll see it's it's hard to tell when they just went public we'll see on some conference calls we'll see and all the filings, but I really, really liked both of the founders. They seemed like, I don't know, they just seemed, you know, normal, fine, really they competent, were, yeah, they've they done were. the right things. Um, low lights, I worry about the path to profitability while growing. Um, as with all these capital apparel companies, you have inventory concerns, you have R&D spend, especially more R&D spend because they're doing so much of the sustainability investments here. And then you have the marketing spend that uh, I think Brad was talking about that could stay elevated. And then I worry, I don't think there's a true competitive advantage like we mentioned before. Also, I would say if you're interested in this company, definitely read Shoe Dog, which is the Nike autobiography by Phil Knight, who is the founder of Nike. It exemplifies how precarious these companies can be. They almost collapsed multiple times if they didn't get loans from banks. I mean, Alberts isn't in that position, but it's a hard, hard business to run. And Nike is you know, a great example of it, but uh, there's a lot of times where that business could have collapsed as well. So it, it just feels more precarious than I think, me, excuse me, the valuation comes into or is assuming, but let's move on to bull case and bear case. Brad, what's your bull case for all birds? Yeah. Um, I think they need to find success in, in other verticals beyond shoes. So t-shirts or shorts or, or whatever you want to, you want to call it. I think that needs to happen. Uh, just again, not, not to be too redundant, but 13% revenue growth for the multiple that this company is fetching, it, it needs to accelerate a lot. So bull case also, this might sound a little weird, is that that the pandemic was actually a massive headwind for them. I'm not sure if this was the case, but it was a massive headwind that they're overcoming and, and growth is going to speed up from 13% to hopefully ideally somewhere in the compounding at 25 to 30% at least range for the multiples and the margins that this company fetches. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure how, how big of a, of a head when the pandemic was for them. We were, we were kind of debating this before, before the talk, but I mean, yeah, 
Um, their brick and mortar stores were definitely hurt, but this is a, a predominantly digital direct to consumer brand. Um, so how, I'm just scratching my head at how they, they had 13% growth. Um, in, in 2020. And the bull case is that that greatly accelerates because they find more success elsewhere. All right, Ryan. My bull case is that they get acquired. I, I think it's a logical fit for a bigger retailer to purchase. Um, most likely, or the most practical fit, in my opinion, would be Lululemon. They're trying to get into shoes. Merge the men. And the Allbird <laughs> is, Allbirds is trying to get into clothes. And neither of them is doing that well. Not to mention, as a guy, I pair the two, uh, I pair the two brands together all the time, and they actually kind of have a lot of resemblances in design, like the simplicity and the right amount of nothing strategy. So I don't get the right amount of nothing. Isn't that just like copyable, or maybe it's not? I don't know. I guess I'm I, I'm no expert. People would have said that about Lululemon a long time ago, and I mean, but having, isn't it just that they're selling from Lululemon, and because there's all those whatever. Uh, Lululemon's products that everyone copies, all the other companies copies, and it's not Lululemon's what it looks like. It's that Lululemon's selling it because doesn't all those no. ones all look the same? I think. No, you can tell. But it's just because it, <laughs> they you all look, they look the same to me. But people, whatever. I mean, there there are logos on Allbirds and on Lululemon. It's just not as prominent. It's not the okay. centerpiece of clothing or shoes. Um, but I, I don't know, an acquisition or at least a merger of some sort seems like a really good fit here. Um, outside of an acquisition, it's really hard to rationalize any sort of bull case. Um, they would have to do really, really well in a lot of adjacent markets. And I, I don't see that happening. Um, I think 15% free cash flow margin feels like the potential ceiling here. And they are growing sales too quickly. So to get to three and a half billion, it, it's really hard to make the math work here. Uh, yeah. And they're going to have, like I, I've mentioned twice now, the inventory stuff, plus they're going to be spending a lot on store build outs uh, that will hurt free cash flow margins as well. And that'll have maintenance capex. Um, it's not software. Um, all right. My bull case is they reach a similar status to the top, you know, casual shoe and apparel companies in the world. They probably need to build out about a hundred profitable stores in the U S and then consistently expand margins as they scale. It's going to be a slow expansion because they do live in the physical world, but you can see that with a lot, you know, there are economies of scale here, especially with their more vertically integrated strategy. So I think that's the path if they stay as a company. Um, the store count, or excuse me, the store build out could be a bit underappreciated, and that could be a big bull case, uh, but they're going to really need to execute with that to accelerate growth. Well, I think, yeah, and it's worth mentioning that that will, I think, quickly pick up to probably a quarter of sales um, coming out of the pandemic. Hopefully, yes. Because Hopefully. it was kind of depressed during 2020 while they were building out all those stores. And they're at what, 27 stores now? Yeah. And they said they could get to hundreds. Um, and maybe international expansion is where they have to go to. But that one's a classic, you know. But Every, they're already, I mean, they're already, I think they're already selling internationally. I know, but big like getting, they have a pretty good presence out there. But if they're going to fulfill this valuation, they're probably going to need to have just growth from there. Um, be more. Yeah, they, they are selling internationally, but. Uh, all right, bear case. Brad, what's your bear case here? Yeah, I think the bear case is that this is a shoe company and we've already seen a lot of signs of them beginning to exhaust um, the low hanging fruit that they have for growth before reaching profitability, um, which will make growing profitably even more difficult as, as I guess the path of resistance becomes higher and higher for higher friction customers that, that they haven't yet reached. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it there. Yeah, I mean that's that's very the the simple one and it makes total sense. Uh, Ryan, well, what's yours? It's the same as Brad's that they're just a shoe company. I think they're a great shoe company, but that they end up being just a shoe company uh, in the end. And this design and the allure of simplicity and the right amount of nothingness either fades and it's just kind of a fad, or gets replicated quickly. Um, I have durability concerns here uh, and. Well, mo there's mo concerns. Yeah. Because the industry will be there. I mean, durability for this business specifically. Right, right. Brad? Yeah, I remember so just, just a case study that I wanted to quickly talk about. I don't know if you guys are familiar with LA Gear, um, but it's it's like an iconic case study that every single one of my graduate professors loves to teach about. But it, it was an iconic shoe and fashion company in the 80s and 90s that just wasn't really able to pivot with the times and match trends and match fads. 
um, and match patterns. And they, they just, they, they blew up. They, they completely went to zero. So I just, I want to talk about that because in, in this, in this industry specifically, tastes change very quickly and management um, needs to be able to figure out and forecast where, where those tastes are moving towards. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Difficult task. That's why when looking at companies in kind of a similar regard, like Peloton and Yeti, where you're going off of that consumer brand, it's, it's harder to forecast. And I almost think they deserve a depressed valuation just because of that risk. But mine, uh, similar to you guys, I think if they have no true competitive advantage, that leads to copying it, their innovations from other companies. I see no reason why the big companies cannot do this. Um, they may not have the incentive. It could be kind of some sort of counter positioning or innovators dilemma type deal, although I don't think it's that drastic. Um, and we've talked about this before, but I, I wouldn't discount how the lack of a logo makes the need for marketing spend to be higher than the competition. Uh, I would have known if they had this like logo, I would have known that Ryan had those shoes and, and I would have been like, oh, I know where to get those now. Like those look nice. Uh, but now I think it has, I think it's definitely going to be higher. And then I would ask with the brand awareness thing, if only 10% of the U S population knows about them, why is that? Is it only because they've been around for five years? That could be true. But is it because there's some part of their business that's not leading to getting a full brand awareness across the across the country. That would be my big concern. And that comes back to the marketing spend. Um, uh, you know, they could be elevated. All right, let's wrap things up more or less interested. What are we, uh, Brad, what are your final thoughts? Uh, because I love the product so much and because, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with what they, they do and I understand the business so well, I'm going to say more interested and less, less interested today and, and more interested. Um, and I'll be looking to see if I become more interested based on if they find success um, elsewhere, uh, if their if their revenue growth kind of diversifies a little bit, um, that that would help me become a, a lot a, a lot more interested. And also, if this thirteen percent revenue growth, I, I don't want to keep being a dead horse, but that needs to accelerate so much. And I I think they have a chance to do that. I, I'm I, I it doesn't make sense to me why the why they slowed down so much in 2020. But if they can speed up and, and prove that's a blip, then that brings me back into a more interested frame of mind. And, and, and I think um, the stock could could struggle to to grow into its its shoes for a little while. So um, I think we have time to see if they can prove themselves and to see if that can accelerate. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot more favorable risk reward opportunities on this name in the future uh, with more information. Right. Yeah. I mean, you talked about it a lot, but it is important. The revenue growth is is key. I mean, that, that's where everything starts. Uh, Ryan, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm I'm less interested. I don't tend to, I mean, I hope they stick around because I love buying their shoes, but I'm, uh, I, I think this company should have stayed private. I'm not sure why they're public. And it uh, it's a little frustrating because I'm not that good with consumer goods companies anyways. This is probably going to need a 95% drawdown before I'm interested. Yeah. And I think we would all be more interested if the price wasn't so egregious. Uh, I'm less interested, but let me just look at, and I've say Nike every time, but that's the easiest example to give because they are the uh, hundred beggar, almost a thousand beggar in, or probably definitely a thousand beggar uh, in this industry that is executed. And they basically probably deserve the, the, the top valuation in there. And they have the economies of scale already to give them better margins. They're trading at a last 12 month EV to sales of six. Um, and that's during the peak of a, well, maybe not the peak, but you know, we're at all time high valuations. Um, they definitely have better sort of capabilities with manufacturers and all that type of stuff to get better margins out there. They are also D to C now. So there's no difference between that and Allbirds. So you look at that, you compare it to Allbirds valuation. I mean, it's just kind of tough to wrap your brain around. Uh, but that's what it is like with an IPO. So we'll see. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like we'd be more interested if the stock, the market cap wasn't so, I don't want to use the word insane, but it's pretty crazy. Insane. Well, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know. We're not, IPOs are broken. I think we've talked about this before. IPOs are just, they're, they're, they're frankly broken and it's making me wait at least six months before yeah. after they have, an they, IPO. Have, they have the 180 day lockup. So I, have, I would just wait for that. Yeah. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm less interested. Uh, what's our stock for 
two weeks from now. Yeah, it's going to be. I believe it's your pick. It's my pick. It's my pick. We're going to do Matech Systems. Uh, it's a little bit of a cheat code because we own one of their quasi competitors. Uh, don't want to disclose that, but the uh, it's going to be, I don't know, they're an identity company. They're trying to ride a big tailwind here. Kind of a legacy business. Should be a fun one. Uh, I think I was inspired by seeing a tweet thread on it this morning. So I don't know. The tech system should be a fun one. Sounds good. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. Thank you all for listening. Remember, we are not financial advisors. Anything we say on the show is not formal advice or recommendation. Ryan and I are general partners at Arch Capital. Arch Capital clients may hold securities discussed in this podcast. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time.